I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science. I'm your host, Taylor Sparks. I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Andrew Falkowski. And today, all the way from Boston, we have a visitor. We have Nick Sandlin from Technor Apex. Nick, you're going to be here on this episode to tell us all about the world of biodegradable plastics. And specifically, we're going to talk about PHAs. So we'll get into that in a moment. But first, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's got, hopefully, it's going to be an interesting uh, hour or so for conversation. But um, yeah, so originally um, from the UK, um, I've been working in the industry now for just over 35 years. Um, I first got into plastics and polymers in general um, through a high school uh, work experience um, session two weeks working in a plastic molding factory. Um, at the end of that, we, uh, we got sort of uh, captured by the local uh, lecturers at a, at a local tech and they were running a polymer science course and they organized apprenticeships with uh, local students. I signed up for that, spent six years at, um, at this tech studying polymer science. I was a chem graduate of the Plastics and Rubber Institute, which has now been absorbed by the Institute of Materials. And then I converted that to a degree in polymer technology and materials engineering at Loughborough University. So, okay. so that's how I got into it. Um, started off doing a lot of sort of the low level jobs, working in the lab, working in the factory, figuring hey, out. Putting in the time, oh, figuring yeah, out how yeah. this stuff all works. Done all the crappy jobs that nobody wants to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, then sort of moved my way around. Mainly it was in sort of automotive applications, sort of ru you know, rubber compounding, for, you know, lab testing, functional testing, that kind of thing. Are these just for wheels or is this like for bumpers this and stuff? This was a whole range of things. Initially, it was sort of sealing systems for cars, so like door seals, oh, okay. uh, that kind of thing. That was the main part. Um, then I moved over to another company that was doing high-end sort of fluoropolymers for oil seals, for car engines, valve stem seals, crankshaft seals, things like that. Then I spent a little bit of time um, working for um, a company producing high-performance elastomers as well. So I was the tech service guy helping customers fix their problems, develop their products. And then um, 18 years ago, I moved over to Techno Apex. So they were looking to get into selling their thermoplastic elastomers in the UK. Um, they hired me as a sort of essentially a one-man show basically to do tech support, sales development, and sort of build out the business in Europe. And then... In 2008, I actually moved, relocated to the U.S. For, for three years, 15 years ago. Um, and since then, I've been in various sort of commercial leadership roles. But it, for the last two or three years, we've been spending a lot of time trying to partner with young startups with, you know, cool new materials, trying to figure out what's going to change the industry. So I mean, Techno Apex is a 100-year-old company. In fact, this year in September, we're 100 years old. And I think people are now looking to see, well, what technologies are going to keep us going for the next 100 years? And so part of my job is to uh, sort of identify those new materials and the, and the companies in this space. Yeah. Well, you know, Techno yeah. Apex, yeah. you guys reached out to us and yeah. we get a lot of companies now wanting to be, you know, involved in the podcast, which we love. Mm. Feel free to do that. Yeah. Um, and so as we were learning more about you, he brought that up, this idea of, hey, we're 100 years old. And instead of sort of resting on your laurels, I think it's so cool that you're saying, how do we disrupt ourselves mm. to make sure that we are around for another yeah, 100 years? It's going to happen. What so a cool approach. Do you want to be doing it or have it done to you? Kind yeah, of thing, exactly. You know? Yeah. And we're actually hopefully partnering mm. with you guys to do some of that for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, all right. So Technor mm. Apex, just mm. a word about what you guys are. Yeah. You guys are a polymer compounder. Yeah, we're a plastics compounding company for the most part. We've been around... We, we got into compounding rubber way back when, um, sort of tire compounds. Um, then slowly we moved out of the rubber compounding. We got into compounding of PVC back in, I th somebody told me, I think it was something like 1949. So uh, Real quick, yeah. for our listeners that aren't familiar yeah. with the word compounding, because yeah. that's not always brought up in mm -hmm. material science. Yeah. We talk about a lot of 
processing. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between yeah. polymerization, yeah. making a polymer, yeah. and compounding plastics? Yeah, so most people think of plastics as a sort of a single, single material, um, you know, that comes out of the big chemical plants. So we take those pellets and then we blend them with other materials. We put additives in to fine tune the properties. So if 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 you can't get what you need straight out of the reactor, then typically you'll work with the compounder to, you know, fine tune that product. And a lot of what we do is customize specifically to individual requirements. And the plastics all around us, right, that are on our laptops mm. and our microphones in front of mm. us and yeah. our clothing, right? Mm. Are these yeah. all compounded or are they uh, typically single? The real, the real high volume stuff tends to be single polymer stuff, but a lot, there are a lot of compounds out there that get sort of Okay. Mixed in there, so. And is it a lot of mm -hmm. different polymers that are mm -hmm. being compounded, or is it yeah. different chain lengths in order to maybe mm -hmm. get a blend of two properties? You can, you know, for, for example, you could blend, you know, two different molecular weights to get a property in the middle. You know, you're trading off, you know, viscosity for mechanical properties, and you want something in the middle. You can blend those two together, or maybe you want to impart some extra characteristics like flame retardancy. So you can add in flame retardant additives that can uh, that can help improve the fire performance, that kind of thing. Okay. All right, so in today's episode, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about biodegradable polymers mm -hmm. and a specific family of them, which is, we think, on the horizon, mm -hmm. which are PHAs. More on that in a moment. Yep. But we've talked about polymer recycling in the past, so we're going we're gonna to differentiate between polymer recycling in our previous episode, episode 12, right? We talked about the science of separation. We painted a kind of dismal picture of mm -hmm. what's happening yeah. with recycling. Basically, it's not happening. Yeah. Even if you think it is, the stuff you put in your blue bin, probably you would be disappointed to see mm -hmm. where it's actually going. Yep. So if recycling has its challenges, and we think it does, mm -hmm. maybe we should be looking towards options where you use your plastic and then it gets degraded or biodegraded back to starting materials where you can reutilize it. At least that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the hope. Is that a reality or not? It is a reality in the future today. It's still, still very much in its infancy, but um, it's going to be a component of solving the issue. You know, biodegradable polymers are not going to solve it completely. Recycling is not going to solve it completely by taking a sort of a multi, uh, multifaceted approach to the whole problem, I think that's the only way it's going to be resolved. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's going to be necessary. Reading through a number of articles, it seems like the state of plastic recycling is pretty dismal. Oh, yeah. Like, I think a 2023 article said that only like 5% of plastic in the U.S. is actually recycled, which is pretty mm. bad. And, it, you know, the amount of advertising surrounding recycling wouldn't mm. have you believe it's that low. Um, and yet, if, if we don't recycle it, can I read this stack that blew my mind? This came from a paper that my student and I wrote. Amber Barron, if you're out there listening, it's from your paper. Uh, it's, it's on commercial man, marine degradable polymers. Like if stuff makes it to the ocean, how do we make sure it degrades? This stat right here, it says it's an estimated 20 million tons of plastic mm. that's in our oceans now. And that's going to increase to the point until it will actually outweigh the fish population by the year 2050. So in a short period of time, we will have more junk in our oceans. It's mm. just plastics. Then we'll actually have fish life, which is wild. Mm. And even when it is recycled, um, we'll put this article in the show notes. Like these, like recycling plants actually spew microplastics in the recycling process. I think they produce about six to three million tons of microplastics per year. And the study was actually on a brand new facility, so you, you can imagine that older facilities are worse. So most plastic isn't getting recycled, and when it is, you know, there's still plastic that's ending up in our environment in potentially an even more hazardous form. Yeah, watch for a future episode mm -hmm. on how much microplastics we're eating mm -hmm. and is in our bodies oh, very yeah. soon. Yeah, I mean, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine last week that talked what about... What did it say? It, it was talking about the... They found microplastics in uh, placentas and oh, breast yeah. milk. Oh, and, my gosh. And it's, it's crazy when you think about it. I mean, there's a whole host of other things in there as well, but uh, this is obviously where a lot of the attention is being focused at the moment. Okay, so, so maybe like... If a lot of these are ending up there, like what is the lifespan of a piece of plastic in a landfill or maybe in the ocean? Yeah, I've actually got a cool stat from our paper. Now, this is for one class of materials. These are for PHAs, mm -hmm. which are some of the better ones. We're going to yeah. talk about them today. Even then, it depends on the rate of the, of the biodegradation, and it depends on the thickness of their component, mm -hmm. right? So typical rates might be like 0 0.04 milligrams per day per centimeter squared, mm -hmm. and maybe as high as double that. So then if you start to think of types of materials that are ending up in the ocean, so things like as thin as a bag or as thin as a straw or, or as thin as a straw, or as thin as a bottle, or all the way up to like cutlery, your time for that thing to completely degrade, best case scenario, mm -hmm. is between sort of like one year and six years. And that's for the biodegradable stuff. Mm -hmm. Now you compare that with something like high density polyethylene, and you're talking mm -hmm. much, much longer yeah. time frames. Yeah, decades, if not a hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the bonds yeah. are so much stronger in mm -hmm. these, right? They're yeah. high performance plastics. And 
you know, microbes end up not being, you know, able to. They're, they're designed to last. Yeah. yeah. And, and they do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Nick, uh, mm-hmm. with that sort of backdrop, can you introduce us to the family of quote unquote, you know, biodegradable mm-hmm. polymers that are out there right now? Yeah. I mean, um, sort of PHA is the one we're here to talk about specifically, but there's, there's a whole host of others. There's, there's sort of the polycaptrolactones, the poly, you know, the PBATs, the PLA, the PBS, a whole range of things um, that biodegrade um, due, essentially due to hydrolysis um, from the ester linkages within those uh, structures. Okay, walk people yeah, through that, that yeah. bit of chemistry. Yeah, so ba- basically, um, you know, PHA is, is metabolized by the bacteria, so it actually gets eaten and consumed. Um, whereas the the rest of the biodegradable materials, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hydrolysis reaction. So it basically, um, you get the breaking down of the molecular chain. So it, it, instead of it being eaten, it gets broken down into shorter molecular weight polymer pieces. And this is where um, microplastics are formed because they don't continue to degrade, whereas these materials will, will continue back down to essentially, you know, the carbon, the oxygen, the hydrogen that they're formed from. And when I look into these, I've got in front of me this table that shows a bunch of the families of commercially biodegradable mm-hmm. plastics. There are some common chemical motifs in them. Mm-hmm. For example, you said this ester group. And an mm-hmm. ester, right, you've got yeah. your repeating backbone. And then sticking off the side, yeah. you've got a double bond to an oxygen. That's yeah. ester, right? Yeah. Why is that such an important piece? I see it in mm-hmm. almost all the families. Mm-hmm. There's a few other things similar, but yeah. that seems to be an important one. Yeah, I mean, it, it's susceptible to that sort of uh, that hydrolysis reaction. In fact, quite often it's a problem because yeah. you're trying to design these materials not to break down because they need to perform into certain, you know, environmental conditions. And so you actually put additives in there to try and delay the onset of those reactions. So now we're, we've got these sort of competing requirements is we want it to, we want it to last as long as it needs to last in the application, but then we want it to magically disappear. Yeah, snap your finger and, it, and it's and gone. And away it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the challenge with trying to design parts and material to meet both the functional requirements and the end of life requirements. So it sounds like we have a number of biodegradable plastics out mm-hmm. there, but are these enough? And why is there interest in going further and switching to something like a PHA? Mm-hmm. PLA, yeah. a polylactic mm-hmm. acid, is kind of the front runner right mm-hmm. now, it would seem. It's, it's the most produced biodegradable plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems like there's still some issues there. Yeah, again, it's, it's one of these, because it breaks down via hydrolysis, it doesn't break down maybe as rapidly as people would like. And it has a specific sets of conditions under which that it has to um be exposed in order for that degradation reaction to take place and so it you know for example you know this when you sort of dig into this sort of the biodegradation there's there's a number of ways of doing you have aerobic and anaerobic and you have different temperatures and moisture levels and things like that and so pla will fully biodegrade under certain conditions and so it's great in those areas but if that if the conditions that you're looking for aren't in existence where that item happens to be, then it isn't going to break down as completely as you would like, or it will break down much more slowly. Yeah. So tell me a bit more about that. For Mm -hmm. example, we were chatting offline about Mm -hmm. this, about the ocean, right? So something makes it to the ocean. Mm. The ocean is not like a homogeneous Mm. thing, right? Oh, absolutely. Because the bacteria, the, the, the animal and plant life, all these different things that will Mm. impact its degradation change. Uh, first off, radially, as you go towards out deeper into the ocean, Mm -hmm. but also there's different temperature regimes. There's the impact Mm. of sunlight. What if your plastic is so dense that it actually sinks to the bottom of the mm-hmm. ocean? Absolutely, yeah. Like yeah. your microbial activity is going to be totally different under yeah. all these different and UV, conditions. Then you've also got the sort of contributing factors of oxygen and UV exposure, you know. Right. And, you know, so again, you know, if, you, if you're on the near shore, you know, you've got a lot of um, sort of runoff from the land. That, so you have a lot of bacterial activity. So you will get fairly rapid breakdown under those conditions. You go out to the deep ocean, you've got completely different bacteria presence quite often much lower levels temperatures can have that effect and as you say quite often these things will sink to the bottom yeah so mm. so basically what you're saying is mm. even if i have pla yeah. even if it's biodegradable yeah. that doesn't mean i can just throw it in my backyard and exactly it'll, it'll yeah you can't just throw it over your shoulder and it'll 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 still be sat there a couple of years later yeah okay. <laughs> yeah and one other thing i was looking at is that pla usually they actually derive mm. it from corn mm-hmm. or sugarcane and yeah. stuff and so there's a lot of concerns mm. about if we switch to such a plastic, this now competing for traditional food sources mm-hmm. or um, food sources that are used in other things. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, you know, this is when you sort of, you get into the nuances of biopolymers in general. And, you know, one of the areas that we've been focusing our attention on is, is those bioplastics that don't actually compete with food sources. You know, if you want to go to the sort of 
the most basic level, you know, there, there's companies out there that are doing conventional polyethylene, but they take sugarcane to create the the uh, the ethanol, to create the ethylene that is then used to make the polyethylene. Uh, but functionally, it's exactly the same as a standard polyethylene, but it's just de- it's not derived from crude oil. Then you've got the polymers that will also biodegrade as well. So you've got to and so you've got to figure out what kind of or what flavor of bioplastic do you actually want. And this is where we see hugely inconsistent approaches and this is it varies by region it varies by industry and even by company you know and we 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 had a project um a few years ago where we were working with a customer and they wanted an entirely bio-derived material from us so we worked diligently we found all the raw materials we made the product they did the testing everything looked great and then we did the carbon footprint analysis and the carbon (laughs) footprint was more than double that of the conventional oil-based materials so they then disappeared into a room for a few months, came back and said, okay, now we want recycled material. And so it was a complete change in direction. So you've got, you've got to figure out what you actually want before you can figure out how to get there. So with that backdrop, let's now introduce the star of today's episode, which yeah. are going to be these PHAs. So first off, what does PHA stand for? Tell us about them mm-hmm. chemically. So PHA is uh, polyhydroxyalkanoate, and it's a family of naturally occurring polyesters. Um, you know, it's it's unique, I think, in the fact that it is it's produced via a fermentation process as opposed to a sort of a traditional petrochemical polymerization reaction. Ah, so, okay, so fabric the manufacturing is yeah, different. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And so they were first. You know, my, I, I did a little bit of research for this podcast, and I found um, in this book that I have here um, that it was first documented back in 1925. Um, and it was it was more of an academic curiosity. It got re- it got registered, and essentially nobody did anything about it because they didn't know what so to it do. With goes. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, then back in the nineteen seventies, ICI in the UK did some research on these materials, and so they they made a lot of progress. But again, it was more sort of academic than trying to sort of turn it into a business. Um, but this formed a sort of a jumping off point for some of the other companies in the 90s and early 2000s that then actually attempted to commercialize PHAs. Um, unfortunately, with the economic crisis back in 08, there was a lot of money got pulled, funding was removed, the, the general market sort of sure. focused on, you know, trying to stay alive as opposed to yeah, uh, innovate. um, innovation. And so the, things took a bit of a backseat. But over the last, you know, five to ten years there's been a huge amount of sort of uh, a resurrection in the activity here and there's now maybe 25 35 companies around the world that are producing phas at various scales and i think it's interesting to note like we say phas if it's mm-hmm. one thing yeah but my understanding there's over 150 mm-hmm. different monomers that mm-hmm. fall into this PHA oh, it is absolutely a very very broad family of uh, of polyesters and so again by varying the sugar source for the fermentation, the bacterial strains used to produce the fermentation, the conditions under which the fermentation takes place, you can effectively control and alter the structure of the, uh, of the, of the molecule. So there's three big ones that I mm-hmm. have uh, in yeah. front of me here. You've got PHV, that's polyhydroxyvalerate, yeah. and then PHB, mm-hmm. polyhydroxybutyrate, and yeah. then the blend of those two, PHBV. Yeah. So if you yeah. see those names, yeah. these are all PHAs. Yeah, but, yeah. and, you know, and we, you've got the P3HB, P4HB, but, but when there's I a whole look at these, range like, of them. The structure is really interesting because mm. it's, mm. it's, first off, it's it, remarkably similar to polylactic acid. Mm. Uh, polylactic acid basically has two carbons followed by an oxygen along the backbone. Mm. And then it has side groups. One side group is the ester, right? The yeah. double bond to the oxygen. And the other one is a methyl group. Yeah. So compare that to the PHAs, it's the same thing, except yeah. we have one more carbon in the back group. Mm-hmm. And the side group might not just be a methyl. It might yeah. be like an ethyl group. Yeah. But basically, yeah. in other words, I'm, I'm surprised looking at this, realizing that a structure so similar can have such markedly different mm-hmm. Um, performance when it comes to microbial activity, um, which is which is maybe to say like you know microbes have mm-hmm. evolved for yeah. as long as they have and they've grown sensitive to these very slight differences. But it, it struck me as surprising mm-hmm. that something with such subtle difference in the structure could have such interesting applications in terms of biodiversity. Yeah. I mean, in in very simple terms, this is my simple terms. Um, you know, it's produced by the it's produced by the bacteria and it is also consumed by the bacteria. So it, it, it sort of it's eating its own food, um, whereas it it doesn't see these other polymers in the same way. Yeah, because it, it comes, yeah, because the microbes actually develop this, or microorganisms mm. develop this as under stress conditions. Um, what I was doing some reading is normally they have their own sort of process that is, is happening um, for, in their metabolism for gaining energy. But under stress conditions or when nutrients or certain nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen are scarce, they will now divert and suppress oh, interesting. The, the mm-hmm. development or the growth of, their traditional food source and they'll actually create these PHAs 
uh, within themselves as these mm. uh, energy storage. As like a non-ideal, but we can make it work sort of situation. Yeah. And that's usually in the mm. presence of excess carbon with mm -hmm. deficiency in yeah. nitrogen or phosphorus. So we're able to compound them, but this, from my understanding, looking through the literature and based on our offline conversations, this seems like this is still very much an area of active development, right? There's still some work to be done. So can we talk a little bit about the challenges facing current PHA development? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the, the biggest, the biggest challenge really is simply scale. Um, oh, you know, yeah. the, the, the traditional petrochemical polymers, they've had, you know, 50 to 100 years to optimize and achieve that scale and get everything perfectly balanced. We're talking for the maximum amount of time, people have been producing these polymers for maybe 10 or 20 years. And so, the, you know, the, the amount of experience, the amount of infrastructure that's been built up around PHA-type polymers is very, very limited. And, and because they are produced through fermentation, there's not, a lot, there's not a lot of experience. You know, there's a lot of people who've been producing fermented materials for, you know, pharmaceuticals, for nutraceuticals, but they tend to be very, very high value, low volume items so that you can afford to spend the time on the manufacturing process. When you're getting into industrial chemicals and, and you know, commodity type materials, which is essentially what we're talking here, is you've got to be able to make these products at scale very, very effectively, consistently, week in, week out, year in, year out. When you say that they're made via fermentation, mm -hmm. are you still using a biological pathway to make them, or is this a synthetic yeah. fermentation pathway? No, no, no. They're, they're, it's a biological pathway. That's yeah. really difficult. Yeah. Getting bacteria or microbes to do what you want them to do and to do it repeatedly yeah. and to do it on a scale and on with, demand. With, with yields that Man, are that is economically hard. viable. Yeah. yeah, and this is the challenge. And it can be done, right? They yeah. make beer, yeah. for example. Right? But yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's the technology. I think in recent years, the technology has advanced to a, le to a point where it's enabled people to do it at scale more consistently right because it's so challenging to have to actually harvest this from mm. the, the the microorganisms because mm. they grow it inside and then you you either dissolve them like you have a mm. solvent you have an enzyme yeah. attack them or you can do like mechanical with like a centrifuge type processes. yeah centrifuge yeah. as yeah. well yeah. but really? that you know mm. even using those actually changes the pha yeah. monomer and changes what sort of yeah. properties you're going to get out Exactly, yeah, and so you know the the the, the early stage PHAs, you know, they've got this a, a nice story to tell around the fermentation process, but everybody sort of skips over that difficult bit in the middle where you've got to extract the PHA from the broth, and quite often it was you know very high temperatures, very high pressures, very aggressive hydrocarbon solvents in order to extract the PHA from the broth. There's newer technologies that are lower temperatures, less hazardous, so that is what an, a key area to that needs to be overcome in order to get commercial viability on a large scale. And I've got another question, right? So I'm thinking six years mm. ago, Francis Arnold of Caltech got mm. her Nobel Prize on directed evolution to mm -hmm. engineer enzymes. Basically, yeah. as I understand it, not an mm -hmm. expert in the field. Yeah. So take it, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. But essentially, as you provide different environments intentionally, mm -hmm. maybe to stress or whatever, you're changing the, you're allowing these enzymes or the bacteria to evolve differently. Yeah. And then they will start doing what you want them to do. So, if you are repeatedly showing your bacteria or a certain environment, will they change over time in response to that? And therefore, will your yield be consistent and forecastable yeah. into the future? Or is it changing over time? That's an area that's still being researched. This is yeah. where we, we as Techno Apex, we are sort of working with companies and, and sort of R&D groups that are working to understand oh, wow. that. So we're not actually doing that ourselves. But it's, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating area that uh, has got a lot of work to be done on. Yeah, I noticed going through the literature, there's a lot of interesting ideas. So a lot of times they use, they'll also use food stock to mm -hmm. feed the uh, the microorganisms, but that runs into the same problem as PLA, right? Because now you're diverting mm. food away from yeah. food. Not going to be uh, a popular option. Microorganisms. Yeah. And so some people have suggested using waste food and mm -hmm. waste streams like that, but whatever you feed them changes the properties mm -hmm. of the PHA that you're going to produce. And so there's been lots of research from what I've seen, and, and maybe you can comment on this, Nick. Uh, looking into alternatives like microalgae, mm -hmm. which actually produce PHA through a photosynthesis mm -hmm. rather yeah. than a, a consumption process. So yeah, there are actually a couple of companies that are in the very early stages of producing PHA from algae and seaweed today. And they're still at the sort of the R&D pilot lab scale kind of thing. But uh, it's fascinating that they're, they're, they're looking at that. We've, we've worked with, with guys who are taking dairy waste. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the, the, some of the companies that are at scale today, they tend to use more sort of conventional sugar sources, whether it's sort of, um, sugar beets in Europe or whether it's sugar cane in, uh, in Asia and, uh, and North America. But obviously then you run into those issues with competing with food sources. Another thing is, are, 
are the properties usually what we expect or do designs have to be changed to accommodate these polymers? Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that we as an organization are trying to do is, and it sounds a little cliched when you sort of talk about it, but it's it's got to be done. You've got to build an ecosystem. And so you've got to create, you've got to look at all of the stages in the supply chain and, and make sure that you've pick the right partners who are prepared to work with you. And, you know, one of the things that we found, it, and again, it's not, if you've sort of, if you've ever handled PHAs, you realize they process very, very differently to the more traditional materials. And so when you go to run a molding trial, for example, you know, you have to hold the hand at the molder because they'll go, yeah, yeah, we've been doing this for decades. You don't need to worry about it. And then you realize that it's all turned to a black sludge in the machine. And then they're all, complaining about your material because there's certain characteristics that you have to understand even when you get down to very simple sort of uh, polymer processing you know think of shrinkage in a tool you know you inject your mold a part some plastic into a tool typically you will get a, a, a small percentage shrinkage this allows the part to shrink away from the metal so that you can remove it from the tool pha the shrinkage is very 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 little so you put it in, if you cut the tool for a certain shrinkage for polypropylene, for example, and you try and mold PHA in that tool, guess what? It's going to stick. Now you've got a problem because now you spent, now you're trying to oh, take geez. the part out of the tool. And in the meantime, the PHA is sitting in the barrel of the extruder cooking away. And you, this is when you get the black sludge. So you've then got to start thinking about how many shots are in the barrel of the, of the injection molding machine versus the size of the part, or you just got to rethink your whole approach. And so... So we just did an episode on the ICME mm. technique, which yeah. is essentially putting it bluntly is sort of like mm. not just modeling any single aspect of it, but yeah. m- merging together different mm-hmm. length scales and times to consider the entire process. Yeah. That sounds like this is needed here. Or uh, is oh, it still uh, sort of like one shot, try it and figure, oh, it, now we got a problem. We got still, black sludge. We have to. D- it's a lot of empirical, you know, let's just go figure it out kind of. So approach. there's opportunity here. Yeah. And again, this is where, you know, one of the things we're finding with a lot of the guys who are producing the PHA, they're not traditional plastics industry people. So that, you know, they're, f- you know, super intelligent, you know, biologists and R&D guys, but they don't understand yeah. the plastics world. And so this is where, you know, Techno Apex, we can come along. We can, we, we operate in, in pretty much all of the markets where plastics are used. So we can provide real world examples of yeah. this is what you need to do to be successful. But also we're able to build, bring some credibility so we can, provide some market access that, that people wouldn't have on their own. And we do have, you know, a very comprehensive application development facility. Well, oh, I was just going to say, that, yeah. um, normally I mm. feel like with recycling, it's mm. always, oh, we got to educate the public. Mm. But it sounds like with PHAs <laughs> and this adoption, yeah. it kind of goes both ways, where there's also an educational component to industry. Absolutely. We've got to educate everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that is really seriously one of the biggest problems because everybody thinks they know what they need to do, and generally they don't. And yeah. so, and you've got to find people who are prepared to learn and experiment and ultimately fail and continue instead of just going, oh, this is no good. It'll never work. Yeah. Okay. So Nick, maybe what mm. you can then help us describe next is, okay, these things exist. We think mm. we know how to make them. Are their properties and their sort of as produced forms good enough for mm. applications? Or is that where Technor Apex comes in as a compounder to mm-hmm. modify and blend and adjust their properties through proper mixtures? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are certain applications that where the, the, the straight resin would, would, would work, but that is very limited. Um, and so quite often, you know, you do need to blend these materials together. Also, blending them with other biodegradable materials as well, you can enhance certain characteristics. So, you know, the PHA family, you know, if you just take a simple, you know, the P3HB um, homopolymer, it's extremely hard, it's extremely brittle, and it has limited applications. If you start then introducing... Uh, co-monomers, so you have a P3HB, P4HB copolymer, or you introduce the the, the valerate, the PHBV. You then um, it then modifies the crystallization process, and it affects it completely affects the functional characteristics. And so, as I said earlier, we've I've got some samples here. So we've got materials that are extremely soft and flexible and rubber like, and they go all the way up to sort of hard, tough uh, engineering. Uh, engineering plastic type materials. Yeah, so that, they can potentially span a very, very wide range of applications. Yes. That totally makes sense. I'm looking at my mm. diagram and when you say Valerate increases, mm. it's, it makes it less brittle. Mm-hmm. Well, it's got an ethyl group instead of yeah. an ethyl group. It's got, yeah. so you're pushing these chains a little bit further apart. Like, exactly. so yeah. what I'm trying to draw the connection to mm. is even students who've taken like an introductory material science, mm. if you actually saw the monomer and actually think mm. about how these things crystallize how and how crystallization together. relates yeah. to these properties, 
all of a sudden you realize how this is a tunable system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's you know, you've got to sort of, you know, delve down and sort of visualize the molecules and how they how they fit together. And, you know, you start increasing, you know, side chain length and repeat unit length. And it, it affects how these things are able to literally sort of nest together. And with o- over 150... And I think there's even more like yeah. known yeah. monomers, right? There mm. seems to be a lot of tunability, mm. but are these a one-to-one drop-in for what we traditionally use? Um, no, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a trade-off to be had. There's always a trade-off. Yeah, this is the plastics and that, industry. Well, so, and that's yeah, sustainability. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. If but, you want the best performer mm, yeah. and you're not considering sustainability mm-hmm. or recyclability or impact yeah. environment, then you're yeah. not actually getting the best performer. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 these materials will fit into a sort of a strata of the whole sort of hierarchy of polymers. You know, we're not going to go after the super high performance, you know, the, the fluorinated polymers, the peak sure. type applications. These things are just not going to fit into those types of applications. But in terms of where the issues are with plastics pollution, they fit very, very nicely because it tends to be single use com- consumer type product applications. And these are the ones where the PHAs fit very, very nicely. Okay, so this is sounding Mm. like a, it's an opportunity, Mm. right? There's clearly a need for it. Mm -hmm. There is some open space that needs to be covered in terms of research, but it looks like there's future. Mm -hmm. So I got to wonder, like, what is the... What is the uptake from a social or legislative standpoint? Or is there excitement about this? Where's it? Where's There's that? a whole spectrum of, of feelings around this. You know, um, you know, if you if you're talking to the recycling community, they don't want sure it puts them out of work. plastics <laughs> because they have built businesses around recycling of materials. They also they don't want biodegradable materials contaminating their feedstocks. Yep. So this that in itself is a huge challenge. So what do we do with these biodegradable plastics? We can't just sort of throw them out of the back window and help hope they disappear um but then equally you've got sort of government legislation around restriction of um single-use plastics which in itself is 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 a wonderful thing but phas get caught in the net and so you you have an there's an example in the uk they've introduced a single-use plastics directive and so for certain applications that plastics materials are not allowed to be used but pha falls into that so you have this material which is the ideal material for straws for knives for spoons it can't be used because it falls on it falls under the the restrictions of the single use plastics directive so there's a lot of um debate around it's like how do we classify pha should it actually have its own material class not as a plastic as such and so there's these things are going to take years to get resolved but in the meantime we've got to keep sort of pushing forward yeah. Yeah, when our legislators get yeah. their act together, hopefully, yeah. we still have to have the final solution ready for them. And they're exactly. done. Yeah. Okay. So it seems like it's really easy to see a lot of the, the downsides and the challenges mm. and maybe get discouraged. But to your point earlier about <laughs> traditional plastics having 100 years and honestly oh, having several wars with ample funding for plastics development to aid them mm. in, their, in their development, when you said it was about maybe like 10 to 15 years. So we're only really at the start. We're definitely st- we're in the infancy. People are still figuring it out, and you know, I, I was joking with somebody the other week. You know, most people can't even spell PHA. You know, it's, <laughs> it is it's it's that level of education. We've got to really get back to basics and go. Okay, guys, this is a brand new material, and here's how you do it. So that said, is it finding applications even now? Yes, absolutely. Can, you want to talk yeah. about some of those? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few that are very um, very interesting. You know, not necessarily, and there are also applications where I think the they're they're meaningful to the general public, even though they probably don't understand the complexity of it. And the, the classic is the uh, you know the, the paper cup. You know you go go to the Jeez, coffee yeah. place, you get your you get your paper cup. You think you know throw it in the recycling. You can't. It's it's lined with polyethylene for the mo- most of the time. That paper is lined with polyethylene. It's not recyclable. And so there's a huge part of the industry that's trying to tackle that problem. Um, and so PHA is entirely capable of forming of performing as the paper as the lining for the cups and it would allow you then to put the cups back into a you know into a landfill into composting you could even put it back through the repulping process and the problem with the polyethylene light cups is you can't put them through the through the repulping process easily because you've got to find a way of removing that polyethylene would it just bugger up the process or what Uh, yeah you know it just Again, I'm not that familiar with it, but I, things I've picked up along the way is, you know, they, ha- you know, they, they basically dissolve the paper See. and they have paddles to stir the mix. Now you've got sheets of polyethylene floating around. They get tangled up in the paddles and they block filters and all kinds of things. So you've got to remove that from 
the paper before you can put it back through the process. With the PHA, potentially you could put that back into the repulping process and it would just, it would all happily work. Oh, phenomenal. Yeah. So coffee cups, mm. that's a big that, market. Yeah, what else? everybody can identify with yeah. a coffee cup. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're also, you know, we've been working with, with um, a small company who's looking to get into dog chew toys. Again, you know, you try and find the applications that people can identify with, you know, and, you know, the dog chew toys, they get chewed up. They leave little, you know, pieces around in the backyard or you, the dog buries them in the backyard and you, and you find them three years later. The, these would be ideal applications. And also one of the other sort of components of PHA is that it, it, it is bioresorbable as well. So if the dog happens to bite a chunk off and swallow it, it'll actually get dissolved in the gut of the animal. Oh, what a cool idea. And so, you know, it's it's edible. And yeah. if you talk, it, talk about designed in obsolescence for, yeah. for plastic products, I mean, this is the perfect product. <laughs> you know, I so we wrote this paper mm. and it's in the show notes. It was on, you know, marine degradable yeah. plastics. And if you look in the, in the world of stuff that ends up in the ocean, there's a couple big players, which are not proud of mm -hmm. how many plastics. So Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. you know, there's a few big companies. And it surprised me as I learned more about it, one of the things that ends up are these sachets. Mm. And sachets are these single-use packaging. So in parts of the world, it's not economically viable to buy a gallon of, say, detergent at a time or mm. shampoo or yeah. whatever it is. So instead, they will buy these single-use little sachets. Mm. Maybe like they look like travel size little things. And when you make these things, okay, so you're going to put soap inside of it. What, does, what are the materials properties that sachet has to have? Well, mm -hmm. it has to have a mechanical property, right? It literally has to hold it in. Mm -hmm. But you also typically have to have a moisture barrier. Yeah. If you're putting, say, coffee packets or something, mm -hmm. that moisture will really mess it up. Or it might have to have a perfume barrier if you're putting mm -hmm. a ter detergent in there and you don't want mm -hmm. the smell to escape. So you've got these different layers. Yeah, in you other could, words, you these can are have composites, five right? or seven layers in some of these things. It, and they make yeah. them essentially entirely unrecyclable. And so our takeaway from our study, and this is a couple years old, this is 2020, so maybe the field's moved since then, but is that PHA certainly have opportunity to play a role in the sachet market, in these single-use, degrade, these disposable things. Under certain conditions, yes. But we haven't yet cracked the code in terms of all of the functional properties they have yeah. to have, in terms of moisture barrier, in terms mm -hmm. of perfume barrier, yeah. and those are outstanding areas that yeah. a material scientist could be mm. Absolutely, you know, yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, again, as part of our overall research, you know, we've also been looking into things like uh, PVOH, which is a water-soluble polymer. It actually ha it has very good barrier characteristics as well. So, you know, it can, you know, you combine the you know the magic of pha with the magic of the you know the pvoh type polymers and and you could potentially do something very significant another big application i see is in agriculture like i, I do a little bit of gardening myself mm. there's a lot of plastics that end up being used right you have your plastic buckets that you're putting your your, your plants in there's mm -hmm. often a lot of like tools or seed setting technique or technologies that are, are made of plastic and those don't degrade and so i've mm. seen quite a bit of articles touting phas as being a potential solution there Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that, that, these are sort of almost like the perfect applications. You know, we, you know, clips and tag ties for, you know, you put them around tree, you know, saplings, that, you know, to help them grow. You know, somebody has to go around and clip, cut these things off. They would be an ideal application that, you know, the plant parts and things like that also very, very interesting. But one of the big areas of interest is agricultural film. And so, you know, quite often it's a, you know, it's a black polyethylene film that gets spread across the field. Um, you know, that, at the end, at the end of the point of when you need that film, it has to be removed. So you have to pay people to remove that film from the field. But now that black polyethylene sheet can't be recycled. It's contaminated with earth. F you know, thin film is very difficult to recycle anyway because it, it just is. And so with PHA, you have the potential to just dig it into the ground. Instead of having to pay somebody to remove it and then figure out what you do with it from a recycling perspective, you just leave it there. You dig it in and it disappears. That's phenomenal. And, and, you know, and people are also researching into using the PHA as a binder for sort of slow release fertilizers and things like that, which is also fantastic. You know, so you can have sort of multifunction material. So it can be, it can be the plant part, but it can also have the fertilizer within that. Right. Yeah. And I've seen also a uh, slow release drug mm -hmm. delivery applications yeah. for this as well, where you can control the release mm -hmm. and it's not, you know, we're not concerned of what's going to happen to that mm -hmm. shell that's encasing it. Because it is bio, uh, biocompatible. Yeah, Absolutely. we talked about like the chew toys. So now right. we do the yeah. same thing. Like you yeah. drink, you take your Tylenol capsule, mm -hmm. and now it doesn't matter that there's a bit of plastic in there. Yeah, yeah. And again, there's there's applications like sutures and wound dressings, and even mm -hmm. even you get into the implantable stuff for, you know, uh, sort of scaffolds for for bone regrowth and 
bone screws and things like that. You know, there's a, there's a whole host of areas where this material potentially can be used. And there's a lot of R&D going into that, but understandably, it's extremely time consuming and extremely costly. <laughs> yep. you know, so, it's, you know, if you're trying to commercialize something quickly, this ain't, probably isn't where you want to go. <laughs> Well, well, Nick, I am curious, looking mm. forward, uh, sort of pivoting towards the end of the show here, tell me about the future. What What is yet to be done in your mm -hmm. view? What are like the priority areas that need to be addressed mm -hmm. for this to become a reality? I, I think, you know, th there's the government legislation is definitely something long term that has to address and acknowledge um, how to how to how to treat these new materials. And, it, and, and you see it in in a whole range of different industries where the governments just don't keep up with the pace of change in the industry. You know, you think about software and, you know, it's it's a mismatch in speed that's that's a problem so that that's something that needs to be done um there are industry bodies that are being formed to help lobby governments and uh, and that kind of thing to sort of at least represent this sort of the, the, the wonderful world of pha um the other side is to get to scale you know is to resolve some of these issues you know once you start getting manufacturing plants at scale i think i Again, I could be wrong, but I think one of the, I think the largest manufacturing plant for PHA at the moment is about five to ten kiloton, you know, and that doesn't even register on the scale when it comes to the the, the overall plastics market. So we've got to get the ability to get to scale. So you have to create that pull through from the market. So you yeah. you know the public opinion is there. So now you've got to get the, the the major brands to sort of to buy into the concept and create that pull through. And that it's only when all of these things come together that that is when this thing will truly make a difference. And again, it's not going to solve all of the problems, but there's a very sizable chunk of the market that can be addressed by these types of materials. So is there a, a resource people can go to sort of follow this and, and stay abreast of it? Um, well, our, we joined the, the Go PHA um, organization. It's a, it's a, it's a, a global body um, intended to sort of further the, the purposes of the PHA industry. So most people who are manufacturing PHA are members. Uh, we joined because we wanted to just understand and get closer to the market. There's, a, there's already a number of um, household name brand owners that are, are members and they're very vocal. They're putting a lot of time and effort into this. So we're starting to see some of the real industry influences starting to take things seriously, but it's still going to take, it's still going to take several years, I think, before, before it, it's, it's sort of even on a par with some of the more niche materials. So it's, you're probably talking, you know, 10 years plus before this is yep. something that the general population is seeing and using on a daily basis. Well, do you want to, before we go, can, yeah. we, can you tell us a bit about yeah. Technar Apex and why you guys are involved yeah. in here, what you do yeah. a little bit more if people haven't yeah. heard of your company before? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, yeah. I mean, so as I said before, you know, we're, we're, we're a compounder. So, you know, we take different polymers, we blend them together, we put additives in. And, you know, as part of my role is to try and identify these new materials that were going to disrupt the industry. And one of the things we realized is that there are very few commercially available grades of PHA around on the market today. So... We just, you know, and there's big gaps between them. So we feel that the role of the compounder in the PHA world is more important than it is in other areas of the business. Yeah. Um, so that was very, very um, significant for us. And so that's really where we've sort of, sort of why we've sort of inserted ourselves into this. But as, as a business overall, um, yeah, we're a major compounder of all, a lot of the, you know, household types of plastics some have got better names than others in the general population's eyes but um you know we're trying to do something about it you know so it's That's awesome yeah nick thanks for joining us Thank this you episode felt like it was straight out of science fiction exciting <laughs> to see what the future holds for these materials absolutely yeah it'll be fun okay thanks as a podcast dedicated to expanding the accessibility of scientific knowledge we're excited to tell you about a research tool from a new show sponsor called SciSpace. diving into the materials literature can be daunting the sheer number of scientific articles in the open literature often makes it difficult to determine which ones are worth reading, and many papers include concepts that aren't a part of a standard material science curriculum. This is where SciSpace comes in. SciSpace is a purpose-built workspace that helps researchers explore the literature more efficiently. SciSpace comes with a bunch of helpful tools that can generate literature reviews, summarize articles, and give you key insights from top papers in a subject area. But we think the coolest feature is a research co-pilot that can help explain challenging passages, break down complex equations, brainstorm limitations of papers, and more. We've been using SciSpace in our own research and can't recommend it enough. You can try SciSpace for free at typeset.io, and for being a listener of the show, you can get discounts on monthly and yearly subscriptions with our discount codes Materialism20 and Materialism40, which we'll put in the show notes. This episode is sponsored by California Nanotechnologies, or CalNano. 
If you've listened to the podcast, you know that we are big fans of them. We've done a couple episodes with them, and I, as a professor, have used their services multiple times over the course of my career. They have some really great services. They've helped us with spark plasma sintering at an extremely large scale, way bigger than what you're thinking. They can make some huge components. I've always had great success with them. They turn out high density, quality parts, <laughs> to order, and pretty quick turnaround. Um, and they also have some other capabilities, including cryo milling. Check out our episode on that. We think that they're an awesome company, and we're proud to stand by them as a sponsor of the show. The Materialism Podcast is also sponsored by Materials Today. Visit materialstoday.com to stay up to date on the latest happenings in the material science field and read some fantastic articles they have published. You can head over to elsevier.com to find out more about their journals, books, conferences, and related programs. Thank you, as always, for listening to this episode of the Materialism Podcast. If you have questions or feedback, you can send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, we actually love reading those. I love reading messages from fans. And also, if you do us a huge favor, subscribe to our show. You can find us on iTunes, on Spotify. We used to be on Google Play, but it is now on YouTube. So if you look up Taylor Sparks on YouTube, you'll find them on YouTube as well there. Um, if you leave us a review, we think that will help other people find our content, and that would be pretty rad. And then finally, you can check us out on Instagram. We have the at materialism.podcast page. Um, you can connect with us there, leave a comment. We post lots of behind-the-scenes stuff and videos and pictures. We think you'd like it. And lastly, we'd like to give a shout-out to Alphabot and Colabite for making the music for the podcast. They both make a ton of really cool synthwave music, and you can check them out on Spotify and YouTube. Catch you next time. The adventures of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>